Yes, good. Okay, good it's a little after twelve twenty, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. All right, thank you all for being here on your lunch hour. Um, I hope you all were able to sign in and grab a survey. If not, if you could please do before leaving at the end, I'd really appreciate that, um, just to get your thoughts on the lecture. So um, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Kevin King. He's an associate child clinical associate professor of child clinical psychology at the University of Washington. Um, Dr. King's research interest focuses on how the development of impulsivity provides insight into the development of substance use disorders in adolescents. He is a member of the Motivational Interviewing Mint Network with expertise in the treatment of substance use problems in adolescents and young adults and maintains a small regular practice treating adolescent and young adult patients with addiction problems in the community. I've also been told by a good colleague of yours that uh, you brew a delicious Baltic porter, so <laughs> just to throw that out there. Um, so as you can see, we're halfway through this series. We've got about four left after this one. and. Um, Dr. King's lecture on motivational interviewing on child and adolescent mental health is something we brought back from last year, and we're excited to have him back. So please welcome. Oh, and I'm sorry, one last reminder. If you're asking questions throughout, we do need to get them on the microphone, so I'll be running around trying to get them on here. If you raise your hand and just kind of be patient for me to be there, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Thanks now for welcome. having me. So um, I'm glad to be here. Um, Forgive me if I'm a little bit low energy. I'm coming down with um, some sort of uh, deathly illness. Um, I shouldn't joke. My sister-in-law is actually in the hospital with some kind of uh, flu-related symptoms. Um, but I usually do that. So I really wanted to send her Bon Jovi shot through the heart. Um, <laughs> but I thought that was probably too soon for that. Um, but I'll tell you guys because you don't know her. I'll wait till she's out to give her that, uh, that joke. But I've been saving up that that joke for this, I guess for this talk, totally inappropriate. Anyway, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to hear to talk about behavior change, not about heart failure. Um, uh, and so I'm going to talk about uh, motivational interviewing, which is a empirically supported method uh, for changing behaviors like showing up late to your mentor's uh, lectures. Hey, Connor, how you doing? This is one of my graduate students. Love to give him a hard time. And what I'm going to try to do is cover uh, a few questions here. One is whether motivational interviewing works. The short answer is yes, so I can probably speed through that quickly. Um, the second one is how does it work? Try to give you a flavor of what it feels like to do motivational interviewing. And the third is what does it feel like actually to do the techniques and processes of motivational interviewing? Um, I have a lot in the lecture. I rarely get through the whole thing. The first time I did it, I did because I was well practiced, and now. Uh, because of mission creep, um, any of you who are uh, who give a lot of public talks, especially if you're faculty, know um, that if you give uh, any faculty member any uh, specified length of time, we can fill it. We're sort of like a gas in that way. You just give us a container and we uh, shape it. <laughs> we fill whatever shape we're in. Um, but let's take start by taking a vote. What do you think is most effective in producing behavior change? So I'll give you a bunch of different things that you could do. What about giving someone reasons to change? What about listening to someone's thoughts about changing? What about teaching someone some ways to change? Or what about providing some consequences for changing? How about votes for number one? Raise your hand. OK, what about votes for number two, listening to someone's thoughts about changing? OK, so we have a smattering of votes for number two. What about teaching some people some ways to change? So what about people don't know? So if, raise your hands high. Come on, this is. I'm not going to judge you on this, at least not out loud. What about providing some sort of consequence for changing? OK. So it's sort of a mix. We have an outlier thing of providing some consequence. And then everybody else is sort of mixing between listening to someone's thoughts about changing or teaching someone some ways to change. Well, I want you to think about <clears throat> something in your life that you're thinking about changing right now. And it should be something pretty low key, something that you might be willing to share uh, with a group, even. Something, you know, maybe you're thinking about starting an exercise program, or you're trying to decide whether or not to sell your car, or you're trying to buy a new video game, because um, I'm sure that's really popular in this group. Um, or you're trying to decide whether to, you know, buy that Kindle, or buy a Nook, or something, something like that. Or maybe you're struggling with something else in your life that, you know, that might, you might be willing to share with a group. Um, and I'm going to need one volunteer to maybe share this this work-appropriate struggle that you're thinking about changing in your life. So who's willing to talk about something that you're trying to change in your life, but you haven't actually started changing yet? 
Who's willing to talk about it? One, well, just one volunteer. Promise I don't bite very hard. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So well, I need you to actually come up to the front. <laughs> Second change, that's good. So she's put down the burrito, this is fantastic. So what's your name? Sarah. Sarah, hi, Sarah. So let's welcome Sarah up to the front. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to give you a five-foot illness buffer. So Sarah, thank you very much for coming up. Um, I can give you a ten-foot, too, that's fine. So Sarah, um, so you're thinking you would like to work out in the morning, and you're currently not working out in the morning. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is actually leave. Um, and I'd like you to go outside and think about all the things that you could do to get yourself to work out in the morning all the ways that you can make this change happen, okay? So go ahead, and we're going to stay in here, and we're going to help Sarah come up with ways that she can start working out in the morning. <coughs> and I'd, we have 30-ish people here in the room. Probably We have probably at least lots of bachelor's degrees, some master's degrees, some doctoral degrees here. A lot of pretty smart people. We have some pretty high IQ people here. Um, and you know maybe some low IQ people here, too. I don't know. Who knows? I'm not going to judge. Um, but so let's see what kind of solutions we can come up with for Sarah to help her work out in the morning. So um, go ahead and just give me some ideas. What are some things she could do to start working out in the morning? Okay, wake up earlier. What else? Okay, pay herself for working out. What else? Find out why she wants to. Okay. What else? Okay, what else? How much she could learn how to spell? What else? What else can she do? Get a dog. Okay. Is that related to going to bed earlier or is that separate? Okay, what else? What else can she do? Okay. Okay, what else? Okay, what else? Uh, maybe give me one more. Okay. All right. Let's see what Sarah can come up with. I'm not sure whether to spell it with an H or not. So. Okay, well, I don't know, so I'm just going to take a, you know, I want to give her the option to spell her name how she wants. All right, Sarah, are you ready? So we have a bunch of fantastic solutions, but I want to get yours up on the board before we do this. So um, before we go through yours, so what did you come up with, Sarah? Go to bed earlier. Okay. Turn off the media thing so that I fall asleep Okay. Um, drink less wine at night. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, work out with a friend, join a closer gym, join a gym with a shower so I can go directly from the gym. Okay. Uh, bike tour. Okay. What else? Those are great. Okay, fantastic. Those are really fantastic ones. Um, all right, so they came up with, so there's a number of these actually on the, um, on here that actually are cogent with what you said. So they said, suggested um, finding a friend. So that is here, getting a workout partner. Um, they suggested going to bed earlier, um, which was also there. Um, let's see, what else did she say that you guys suggested? Um, were there others that you guys suggested? Okay, so okay, so how about 
How about getting up earlier? Why aren't you getting up earlier to go work out? Okay, so you don't get to bed earlier. Okay, why aren't you going to bed earlier? So you're, you're hanging out with friends and you're you're drinking. <laughs> okay, and you're and you're hanging out. You're doing media stuff. Um, and why don't you? How about paying yourself to work out? I don't know, but I mean, it's just my work. Okay, so so it's like this is like a circle of right. It doesn't seem to make sense. Okay, well, um, maybe ask yourself why would you want to work out? Maybe sort of some self exploration. Oh, it's already, so that's already pretty clear to you. Okay. Um, how about buying some, like, sexy new workout clothes? Okay, so that's something. So we could... No. Oh, no, okay. That would just, that would just demoralize you. Um, right, like, I get my night tight new yoga pants, and I look in... Oh, my God. Okay. Um, how about get a dog? Okay, so that's like a long-term, long-term goal, but you got to sort of figure it out. So that maybe that's like a maybe there. How about buy an awful outfit to wear if you don't go, like punish yourself with like a tutu or something, or really tight-fitting yoga pants or something, like really awful, like the see-through Lululemon ones or something. The, um, okay, not so. How about find yourself, sort of the opposite of paying yourself for working out, like. Give your money away to the NRA or some really offensive, you know. So not so sure. Okay. How about loading up your iPod with songs that you really like? So you're really pumped to go in the morning. So, okay. So that's some, that's something you like. Okay. Number ten, sort of working out. All right. How about make a list of goals you want to achieve by working out? You've done it. Okay. So it's not. And how come that's not working for you? What's wrong with you? Okay. Something nice. Okay. Okay. Um, how about identify, like, what, what would you have to give up in order to make this happen? Have you thought about that? Like, what, what do you have to give up? What's the trade-off here? Like, what do you have to give up in order to start working out? Okay. So you have to give up sleep in order to start working out. Well, that's, that's actually interesting. Have you noticed we start hearing that? Um, how about downloading an app to track your workouts? There are tons of workout apps. You've done that. And how come you're not? What's wrong with you? You're not fine. <laughs> How about giving yourself a big reward for working out, like going to Europe or whatever your sort of vacate in the wine country? Okay, so you're over rewarding yourself. Okay, okay, thanks, Sarah. That was awesome. That was a perfect example. Okay, so we had, so one of the things I want you to notice is when we have a lot of smart people in the room coming up with a lot of creative ideas and suggestions for somebody else's behavior change, things that seem perfectly reasonable when they're not in the room. As soon as they come in the room, the things that we've come up with, notice first of all how few of them Sarah has thought of herself. And when Sarah comes up with things that she's thought of, all of them are things that fit with her life. Now, how many of us realize that her gym is too far away, the gym that she has doesn't have a shower, that the gym that there's the problem part of the problem is that she her work is too early and maybe her work actually could be more flexible so that she could work out in the morning that she part of the deal is maybe she actually needs to be able to unwind at night maybe like hey you know work I, there's a there's a trade off here and a balance right um we weren't thinking about that all we were thinking about is here's here's a bunch of solutions for a generic average person not for sarah and notice what happens when we give a bunch of solutions to a generic average person instead of a real human being in front of us. Talk about objectifying jerks you are. Right? <laughs> no, I mean, that's what happens when we, when we jump to solutions and problem solving instead of just listening to someone's ideas about change. That's what happens when we ignore um, what's going on in someone's what might be going on in someone's life. Um, and this is why we actually think that simply listening to someone's ideas and having them enunciate the reasons why they might want to change, their need why they might want to change, their ability to change, and have them come up with their eventual solutions is a much better way for them to resolve their own ambivalence and go about change themselves than for us to sit and be the problem solver. And in fact, it's a lot less work. And it takes a lot fewer people. It doesn't take a room of experts. It just takes a person being a facilitator or a coach, and it takes the, the patient or the therapist, uh, 
the client uh, themselves. And in fact, we have lots of data to show that. Confrontation and education don't work. So I'm here educating you and confronting you maybe a little bit, and it's not going to work. <laughs> I can tell you that. It's kind of the great irony of motivational interviewing training. Um, so this is um, uh, from a big meta-analysis of studies of alcoholism treatments. Um, and they suggest uh, that the two best, the largest effect sizes, are broad brief interventions, which are non-confrontative and motivational enhancement, or broad motivational interviewing, and then two psycho, um, psychopharmacolo psychopharmacological agents. These are the best interventions um, for alcoholism treatment. And the worst, general psychotherapy, confrontational counseling, general uh, alcoholism counseling, and educational lectures. So just teaching people about why alcoholism is bad doesn't work. And if we're you know, at all surprised about that, just look at the general prevention literature um, about educational, like, let's teach teens about why drugs are bad, and we should probably not be surprised by this. Um, if we look back in the psychotherapy literature, um, we see examples about, um, it, we see in-session data that shows how and why teaching and confronting doesn't work with therapists. So this is a classic study by Jerry Patterson and Forgatch um, showing uh, that, that what happens when therapists switch modes between teaching and confronting and just listening. So this was a study where they trained therapists to be in one of two modes, one of which was a baseline mode where they simply listened to the therapist. They were sort of non-confrontative. And the other one was a mode where they called teacher confront. So they would argue with their patients. They would confront. They would try to educate. And what they coded was what they called non-compliant responses. And this is just the non rate of non-compliant responses per minute. And they did this in something like five-minute epics. So they had the therapist go back and forth between simply listening and then trying to confront, trying to teach, trying to educate. Uh, their patient. They, and they basically coded how frequently their patients tried to argue, how much they disagreed, how much they acted sort of classically resistant. And you see what's kind of cool is you essentially control how much your clients argue with you and how much your clients disagree with you by, based on how much you confront, how much you disagree, how much you try to teach them and educate them. And you can get away from that instantly by just listening. So all of the headbutting that we do at least a lot of the headbutting we do and a lot of the disagreements and a lot of times we feel like we're locking horns with our patients can at least in part, now this might be overly simplistic, right? There's a lot of things that happen in the session that are very complex, but a lot of things that can happen in session might be explained by interactions between therapists and clients. And what's important to remember is this comes in the context of a long history of psychodynamic theory that put all of the notion of resistance on the patient. That if a patient was resistant, it's something about them. They're in denial. They don't want to change. They don't see that their problem is their problem. That in order for somebody to change, they, somebody has to admit that they have a problem. They have to admit that they're powerless over alcoholism. And that if somebody disagreed and say, oh, I'm not alcoholic. I don't have a problem. We have to force them to, we have to confront them to, um, into saying that they have a problem. We have to get them to admit it. And if they're disagreeing and arguing with you, if they're doing this, it's something about them and not about our interaction with our patients. Motivational interviewing emerges from thinking about interactions between therapists and their clients. Bill Miller started thinking about how do we actually, how do we actually create a therapy that thinks about and actually encodes and trains therapists um, uh, to be more empathetic and to uh, evoke behavior change. So this... Um, this cartoon says, so he, well, he broke your heart, didn't he? Well, I can't say I didn't see this coming. Um, and motivational interviewing uh, arose from Bill Miller's observation that in some of his early alcoholism studies, they coded therapist empathy. And therapist empathy during treatment explained a large amount of variance in early outcome studies. And he developed something called the drinker's checkup, where they train people how to be more empathetic. They train people to do active listening. They eventually develop something called motivational enhancement therapy. A lot of people, um, when they hear about motivational interviewing, think of it as motivational enhancement therapy, where you have uh, an assessment and feedback component along with motivational interviewing, and it's now been generalized into motivational interviewing. Um, defining motivational interviewing is easy. We have a one-sentence definition of it, but then understanding and mastering it really takes a lifetime. So one definition of it, and it probably has actually changed 
um, since the new uh, MI book came out. But the definition that I use right now is a person-centered, guided method of communication to elicit and strengthen motivation for change. So I'll break this up just a little bit. So it's person-centered. It's, um, uh, of, it's thoroughly grounded in classic Rogerian uh, person-centered approaches. Um, but it's also guiding. So it's focused on a particular topic. We come alongside clients. We're not interested in going wherever the client goes. We're focused on a problem. We have uh, a particular direction that we go. If a person comes in and they're using drugs, the assumption is that it's better for them to be using fewer drugs, less drugs, maybe off drugs. Um, so it's not wherever the client sort of feels like going. But it's guiding um, in that we're not necessarily being fully directive. And it's a method of communication, so it focuses largely on how we interact and talk with clients. And we're trying to elicit and strengthen motivation for change, so we're trying to, trying to evoke it from clients, not trying to instill it or put it into uh, clients. Um, so I have a video of Terry Miller, uh, sorry, Terry Moyers, um, uh, doing some motivational interviewing. This is a classic, uh, a classic example with a guy called Rounder, or a guy who was nicknamed the Rounder. This is an actor, uh, but he does an amazing job. So this is, um, he's come in for, uh, he's a court referral guy um, who's been referred. And this is, uh, this is an example of how she responds uh, to some of his resistance. And we'll start with him talking about how he kind of doesn't want to be there. Uh, today. You don't need me lying to you because, uh -huh. you know, uh, unless you go down and tell the court that, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not motivated to be here or anything, but I, I don't like any of this. I'll be honest with you. You know, it's taken a lot of time that I don't have. It's taken a lot of money that I don't have, you know, for the court and the fines mm -hmm. and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. On top of that, I've got to pay my lawyer a thousand dollars, which I don't have, mm -hmm. uh, to, to represent me. And, and I guess he's probably one of the reasons I'm here today, because, yeah. yeah. but you know, he and I drink together. Yeah. You know, I've known this guy ever since he was got out of law school. Yeah. And uh, he's a good friend of mine, but uh, I said, well, wh why do I have to go up there? I'm paying you $1,000 to, to represent me, and now I gotta go over and, and go through this evaluation and all that. That is, does not make sense. Is that it feels like everybody's looking at your drinking, but it's just not as bad as everybody thinks it is. You might say that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's true, but you might say that. Mm -hmm. you know, well, let me ask you this. Since you've been forced to come here, and since you're feeling like everybody's kind of pecking on you like a crow, there's a bunch of crows flying around pecking on you about this thing about your drinking, what would you like to do with the time that you spend with me here? What would be helpful for you? I don't know, because I ain't never been in one of these situations. This is all new for you. Yeah, and people keep saying you need to stop drinking. I ain't never done that either. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I think I could. Mm -hmm. I've tried a couple of times and I wasn't very, <clears throat> I think one time I quit for a week or two mm -hmm. just to show people I could stop drinking. Mm -hmm. So what do you notice about how he uh, entered the situation, about what he was saying at first? What do you notice about what he's saying when I started the video clip? What's he talking about? Didn't want to be there. How frustrated he is. And what do you notice about how her, what her response? I mean, what were the different ways that she could have responded? What's another way that she could have responded? I mean, so this is a guy who has a DUI. He had, probably has multiple DUIs. He's a really heavy drinker. That's probably on his assessment. So there's a lot that she knows about him. Right. Right? She could have argued with him. Say, so look, you have a real problem. Don't you see this? Don't you recognize this? Right? And she didn't do that. And look at what happens when she responds in this different way. Just validates what he says. And all of a sudden he's open, saying, oh, you know, yeah, I do kind of feel put upon. And she's, and, and she's picking up on... Some of the things, you know, she's, she's even saying like, oh, it seems like you feel like you could do almost anything except maybe stop drinking because he sort of has sprinkled that in. And maybe he have, hasn't even sprinkled that in, but she sort of takes a risk and guesses at that. And by doing that, she avoids completely any argumentation with him. And how often are we sitting across a client knowing, dude, you have a real serious drinking problem. 
or you have a real serious problem, or you, we know, we see this, we have evaluations, we have data, and how frequently do we want to just sort of push it at them, right? I mean, it's an urge we frequently have. It's a reflex we have to sort of say, this is what's going on, rather than to, but that's not being present with our client. Terry in this moment is being present with him and reflecting back the content with what he's presenting her in that moment, and that allows him to be more open and reduces his resistance and reduces the possibility he's going to be arguing with her. He was talking about all the cons for spending the time yep. doing this. She did not summarize that. Yep. She didn't validate that. Yep. She took a guess and said, if some effect of this is you feeling like you're picked on by a bunch of crooks. Yes. Is there, are there MI principles that lead her to that? I mean, that's a, a guess as well as an intervention as opposed to a simply, you know. Well, so what, she, yeah, so what she did was a, what you'd say, so in multiple motivational interviewing, what she did, so he listed a whole bunch of cons. One way to respond to that is a simple reflection where you list back what he just said. So the re you're unhappy to be here because of all the negative effects it's having. What she responded is a more complex type of reflection in a metaphor. So you feel like, you know, it's like a bunch of, actually there's a t-shirt that people have made with that metaphor. They, they walked around ABCT one year with that and Terry was really embarrassed from what I understand. Um, but so she responded with a metaphor. Um, if it, but that's simply another way of summarizing sort of what he said. Um, and it's, it's taking a guess, but that's what all reflections are. She's using a reflection to take a guess as to what he's saying and he'll correct her if, if uh, he thinks she's wrong. Um, so does that answer your question? So I, I mean, so I think that's, I mean, that's this, I, you know, there's, there's no right answer about when to do simple, when to do complex. I think you're, you know, you sort of take what you, what you try to do, you use your reflections, however you use them, whether they're simple, whether they're complex, we're using metaphors, you're, you know, cause you can be reflecting the emotion. You can be reflecting the, um, the, co the thought content. You can reflect all sorts of things about what somebody is saying and what all you're trying to do is get a sense of what they're, where they are. You're just trying to be in tune with your client. So I'm getting a little bit ahead um, of where we are in MI, but that, that's what you're trying to do in MI all the time is really trying to understand um, what is going on. And, and you, as you use reflections, for those of you who have a lot of experience using reflective listening, the more that you use reflective listening in a skillful way, the more that you start feeling, you feel it internally, what your client must be feeling. You feel those sort of echoes of what's going on, and then it becomes, starts to become natural. What we know from empirical evidence is that motivational interviewing works for a, a broad range of changeable behaviors. Um, it started in addictive behaviors, particularly alcoholism, um, but essentially anything that you can change on your own, uh, it seems to work for, um, uh, including starting treatment, uh, maintaining treatment for concomitant uh, mental and substance use disorders, um, management of chronic mental disorders. So a lot of these things you say, well, how does it help hypertension? It helps people stay on their hypertensive medications. It helps people manage uh, their diabetes. Anything that somebody can voluntarily change, there, there seems to be evidence through RCTs that motivational interviewing works for. Um, there's been over 200 clinical trials to date the last time I checked. Um, these, the ones that are bolded and underlined, have uh, also shown evidence in adolescents. Um, it's less, you know, it's less effective in children because um, of the cognitive sophistication of children, but there's been lots and lots of research uh, in children. Um, I usually have this slide at the end, but I thought I would move it to the middle because I think it's kind of important um, to point this out. MI is often confused with a lot of other things, um, but MI is not um, a lot of other things. Um, MI is not Motivational interviewing is not the trans-theoretical model. Uh, MI is sort of kissing cousins with the trans-theoretical model of change, the Prochaska and DiClemente model, but it's not, it's not based on uh, the trans-theoretical model of change. It's definitely not a way of tricking people into things that they want to do. The whole point is to figure out what's most important to people and try to evoke that and, and, and try to encourage them to get, what, get them to do what they want to do most, uh, most of all. 
It's very much not a simple technique uh, to learn or deploy, but there are some simple MI-related things that you can learn how to do. It's not just decisional balance. Sometimes you hear people say, oh, MI, that's just decisional balance. That's just pros and cons. MI is not uh, pros and cons or pros and cons with reflective listening. Um, MI doesn't require assessment feedback. Um, some of the origins of, of MI used assessment feedback. MI is not just a form of cognitive behavior therapy. Some people um, have tried to simplify it into that. It's also not just client-centered counseling because it has this very directive component to it. Um, so that's also important to understand. <laughs> MI is not easy uh, to learn uh, or deliver. It's probably not what you're already doing. Um, <laughs> a lot of times, I think that's a risk that we sort of say, oh, yeah, I've been doing MI. You know, I got a training once in it. Um, this is just a, sort of a warning. And MI doesn't work for everything. MI works for things that people can change on purpose and on their own. If it's something that people have decided to change um, and can change without help, if it's something that they can change on their own, MI can probably work for that. Um, but if it's a mental dis if it's a mental health disorder, a mental health problem like anxiety disorders, depression, MI doesn't work for that. Um, but it might it can help people decide to engage in treatment for depressive disorders or anxiety disorders. But it doesn't work for everything, and we don't claim that it does. Um, MI has been extensively studied for adolescents, not adolescent pets, but adolescent humans. These are. Uh, just some of the studies, hopefully you can see this uh, effectively. <laughs> I just thought I would show you a bibliography, but it's, it's been extensively studied uh, for adolescents. Um, th these will be, I think these slides will be put on the web, and I can actually send anybody the actual bibliography if you want to see. Um, but there's, there's been an extensive downward extension um, of MI in adolescent populations. It works really, really well uh, in teenagers, because teenagers, they expect to be treated like teenagers, and when you talk to them, in a lot of reflective listening, non-defensive, non-teaching sort of ways, they respond incredibly well. It's pretty awesome. Um, MI also works in some unexpected situations, like when clients are ethnic minorities, like when procedures are non-manualized. That actually seems to double the effect. And when change language is elicited at the end of the session, but not at the beginning. Uh, in other words, when you sort of use MI as a technique, but not a manualized treatment, um, it seems to work really, really well. Um, I want to skip ahead, because I want to get to some of our um, to an exercise. Um, um, so what we think MI, the reason we think MI works is that we think it, uh, it what it does is it sort of evokes um, people's commitment to change from themselves. You essentially uh, get people to talk about why it's important to change. And we use the social psychology principle that you get people to sell you on why it's important to, ch to change. And when people sell uh, when you get people to sell a product, whether or not they care about the product themselves, the more they talk about it, the more uh, they believe in that product themselves. That's how Amway works. Essentially, M motivational interviewing is Amway for behavior change. So we think that this model of motivational interviewing is you, uh, the more that therapist uses MI skills with the empathy and the spirit of MI, the more that we see change talk and preparatory language in the client, which increases commitment to change and actually leads to behavior change. Um, and MI also doesn't work when you move towards planning change too early. So one of the pitfalls you can have is when, and, and probably a lot of you have seen this, you have somebody come in and they say, all right, I'm ready to make a change, and you jump to making a change plan, and then as soon as you start making a change plan, you start hearing lots of buts. Well, I can't do that, but, you know, I do that, but, or I do that, but my gym doesn't have a shower. I do that, but, you know, I, I don't want to give up, you know, my nightly excursions with my friends, or I do that, but as soon as you start hearing your clients butt all of your solutions when you're coming up with plans, they're not ready to make their change. And you've jumped to change planning too early. When your client is butting you, you're moving towards change too early. Um, so let's do an exercise. So, because um, I think this is, is sort of fun to get people involved. So I want you to choose one person near you to have a conversation with and work together, preferably not your boss or supervisor, and one person is going to be a speaker, and one person is going to be a counselor. So go ahead and partner up, and then I'll give you the instructions about what we're going to do. So the speaker, here's what you're going to talk about. Um, the speaker is going to talk about something about yourself that you'd like to change, that you need to change, that you think you should change, um, and that you maybe have been thinking about changing, but you haven't changed yet. So take a minute um, to think about that. In other words, something that you're feeling ambivalent about. And also that you feel comfortable at sh about sharing. No deep, dark secrets, please. So a speaker, th uh, take a minute to think about that. Everyone have one? Usually these come to mind pretty quickly. All right, the, um, the counselor, your job 
is to find out what the person is considering, uh, what change the person is considering making. Okay? Ask them what the change they're considering making and explain to them why they should make this change. Uh, give them at least three specific benefits that would result from making this change. Tell the person how they could make this change and emphasize how important it is to make this change. And uh, just persuade them to do it. And if that doesn't work, um, just repeat the above. We'll do this for three or four minutes. Is everybody ready? All right, go ahead. All right, let's come back together, and I want to hear about all the changes that you're going to make. And um, we have a microphone to pass around so that it can get on the video, um, so you guys can all be internet celebrities. Um, so, what was that like for you? So, for those of you who were, uh, for those of you who are the speakers, those of you who had the thing that you were thinking about changing, what was that like? What did it feel like? Dead silence now. As soon as I mentioned the internet. Yes, but. Okay, so you were you were yes butting a lot. Yeah. Well, you were so uh, you were talking to Connor. I can understand that was. <laughs> no, yeah. So you were yes butting a lot, right? Okay. Yeah. So you were doing a lot of yes butting. It's like head butting, right? Yeah. So you're, what else? What else were you saying? Yeah. Her and I were laughing through it because we knew that you know it was kind of ridiculous, and this is not MI. Right. But um. Even though I was completely on board with making the change and wanted to come up with solutions, yeah. she was almost talking me out of it a little yeah. bit. Yeah, you kind of back away. Here, why don't you give me the mic and I'll just run around and do that. Yeah, you're backing away from making the change uh, as you do this, right? They, they start talking you out of making the change. Who else, who else wants to share? Yeah. Um, it just felt like she was talking and talking and talking to me, and I didn't really have a voice. <laughs> well, she's got kind of a motor mouth, so I can... Yeah. They... Who, so how many of you felt like the teacher or the counselor talked much more than you did? And as, as counselors, how many of you felt like you just talked the whole time? How much work was that for you? Right. Let me hear from the counselors. What was that like for you as a counselor? Yeah. Yeah, it was annoying. It was irritating. Yeah, it just like she wouldn't, she wouldn't be responding. She wasn't responding to what I was asking her to do. Yeah. I was getting pissed off. Yeah. No, I've worked with her, so yeah. I can understand. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, they are, it makes you, st you start, actually, I can empathize, right? You start having judgments about the clients almost. Now, I don't know if that's quite what you're saying, but you start, you start getting frustrated. They start, why aren't they doing what I want to do? Why don't they pay attention to me? I have all these amazing ideas. Why are they not listening? Um, you start, you start, you're doing an awful lot of work. What was your thought? Yeah, I was going to say, you just have to start guessing because you don't really have anything to say if you're not yeah. listening. Right. You kind of have to start making things up. That's brilliant. Right. You're doing... Her guesses were very judgmental. Her guesses were very judgmental and you're doing so much work and you have so little to go on. I like how you say that. You're doing all of this work and you have nothing to go on because you're doing all the talking. They're, yes, but, yes, but, and... And you're kind of running out of, it's like you're running around on rotten ice and you have nothing to shore you up and you're just like, and you have nothing to stand on. And yet you, yeah, that's, that's nice. What, what were some other reactions from speakers or listeners? Yeah, go ahead and just shout it out. No. Right. I found myself kind of deferring to her authority even though I didn't believe it. Okay, right. So, so Sue's speaking from authority and you're... You find yourself deferring, so it sets up a power dynamic, um, and you so you're you're both like I don't believe this, and yet I kind of feel like I have to defer to it, um, which is a real challenge. Yeah, and, and then he kind of made me feel sad asking if the hour was up yet. Right, so he's asking if the hour is up. Right. Yeah, so we're sort of it's pretty exhausting to do that. Well, why don't we? So I know we feel like we probably just did a lot of damage to your change plan. So why don't we reverse this? So stay in the same group. And I want to redo this exercise, but I want to do it a little bit of a different way. So instead of, so again, find, you know, you already know the change they're making. But instead of explaining to the person why they should make this change, I want you to ask. So only ask questions this time. So ask them why they might want to make this change. And instead of giving them three benefits, ask them, well, why might this benefit you? Why might it be good for you to make this change? Instead of telling them how they could make this change, say, well, have you thought about any ways that you might go about making this change? Um, instead of emphasizing how important it is to make this change, say, well, why would you want to do this change? 
Why would this be important to you? Um, and instead of persuading them to do it, just ask curious questions. So turn all of these, all four of these statements, instead of explaining, giving, telling, and emphasizing, turn them into questions. Do you think you can do that for about three minutes? Okay, go ahead and, and redo this and see if you can undo some of the damage. And this will give you a little bit more of a sense of what MI is really like. All right, what was that like for you? How was that different this time? Go ahead, take for, for, this, for the counselors. What was that like? How much did you talk this time? Much less. So you talked to much. I'll, I'll just repeat your answer so we can be more efficient. How, you talked a lot less this time. What were some other responses? What was that like for you? How was it different this time? It felt a lot more like a conversation. A lot more natural in some ways. More comfortable. Okay. Did you feel like you were doing a lot less work this time? So some of you felt like you were doing some less work. What were some, what were some other responses? You, you got a lot more information. Okay. So if she was happier? Yeah, okay. She was happier. What about the speakers? What was that like for you this time? Yeah. So for you, it was really important to be validated and that you had uh, offering short-term and long-term solutions. And for you to be able to talk and not sort of be talked at and talked over, and, and that right, that, these, you know, that they're going to work. And at the of your right. Yes. Yes. Right. It's a, yeah, it's important for the person to come up with their own solutions. So for you, it was important to be able to uh, try out your solutions and ha get some feedback that say, hey, those sound workable. So it was helpful. Yeah, it was helpful to be able to sort of air them out and have somebody have somebody validate that for you. So it felt right, and that's important for to to have that validation, to have somebody hear what you're saying, and to actually be able to talk it out. That that ability to have somebody to be able to talk over your ideas with somebody, because as you talk them out, right? As sometimes as we talk out our ideas for change, sometimes we feel more confident in them. We start talking through what's going to work, and sometimes we start thinking, oh, that's not going to work, right? Sometimes we have ideas in our head and we think that's totally going to work, but as we start talking them through, they start becoming more real. Sometimes they, they start, they start, we start figuring out how it's going to work concretely, and as somebody talks it back, it really st it helps validating, and sometimes we start figuring out, that's not going to work, and I, here's how I can fix it. It's, a real pro it's actually a real out loud problem solving. Yeah. Right. Well, so that's a great question. So, so uh, the question is, or the point is, how much is it important that you say, well, I've been there, I've been in those shoes. And a lot of times people th can think that that's important. Um, what actually our perspective is that we don't even, we actually don't try to sort of say, I've been there, I know where you're coming from. More importantly, what we try, the perspective we try to take is, I don't know where you're coming from, and I'll try to understand. And I'll ask lots of curious questions, and I won't make the assumption. Because I think the worst mistake that we can make is to, without the patient actually telling us, without the patient actually explaining it, um, is to say, I know where you're coming from, I know where you are. Now, if they're saying, you know, I think some self-disclosure can be useful if they say, I'm going through this, this, and this, and I'm having this experience. Sometimes some strategic self-disclosure can be useful, you know, if you feel close to them, if you feel like it's safe and appropriate. Say, you know, I've had this and this, and you feel like it's the appropriate experience. But sometimes it can be really useful to say, you know, I've never, I can't imagine how awful that is. What I'm, you know, it sounds like you're really struggling and it sounds really horrific. That can be incredibly validating for patients. Um, it, it, as long as, but I think the key is that you sound like you're searching. That's part of refle effective reflective listening, that you're struggling to understand and you're actively seeking to, to reflect and understand their experience. I think that's the key. Because if we simply jump to, I, I know what you're going through, I hear it, that sort of shorthand can be off-putting for some people, especially if they feel invalidated, if they feel like they don't know. Now, sometimes if they feel like, feel like they do, then you can get away with it. But I think you, it's a real risk to, that you can take with people. So I think you have to be careful with, with that approach. Um, and this is actually what, where we're going to because we really want to be on the client side. We really want to show people that we're on your side. This is what we think of as the spirit of MI. This is the fuel of MI. We're trying to collaborate with clients. We're trying to evoke their motivation from them. And we're trying to support their autonomy. Because we're not trying to do the work for them. 
right? We're not trying to, we're not the one who has to go home and do their diet plan. We're not the one who has to change their drinking, right? We're not the one who has to decide they're not going to go out to the bar every night with their best friends and it's going to go to their AA meetings with them or whatever they decide to do. They're the one who has to do it. So our goal is to support their autonomy. <clears throat> we're spo- we're, our goal is to support and evoke their internal motivation um, and our goal is to sort of is come alongside them. We're not going to drag it out of them. That's way too much work for us to do. That creates, that creates uh, therapist burnout. I'll also point out, though, we don't have evidence yet that uh, spirit or variability in spirit is related to client outcomes. So this is more, we think this is what fuels it, but we don't have data yet to show it. Now, it could be, and I just think statistically, that maybe everybody who does MI has a decent amount of MI spirit, and that's why we don't see it, but I don't know. I've tried to talk to Terry Moyers about that, and we're not sure yet. Um, so when we go, the way we start all MI is very Rogerian. Um, we started, and this is sort of what, this is the other thing that fuels it or pulls MI along is what we call the ORs, or these are client-centered listening skills. These are the basic fundamentals of counseling, really. Um, we use, uh, really, the, the real center and heart of MI is re- uh, reflective, active listening skills. And this is everything from simple reflective listening skills to complex reflections, reflecting emotion, reflecting a thought. And this is where I'm talking about here is where you're actively showing the client that you're trying to understand, that you're seeking to understand their experience. It's a process of taking guesses as what they're trying to communicate, what their experience is, what they're saying. And what you find out is people love it. People love trying to explain themselves. You can be wrong nine times out of ten. I mean, make it older the client, I guess, after a while. But they just, they don't, nobody minds correcting you. I think early on in training, a lot of young clinicians worry about, well, what if I'm wrong? What if I take a guess and I'm totally off? People don't mind correcting you because you're showing that you don't know when you're trying to understand. But we also use lots of open-ended questions, and these are contrasted. We don't use closed-ended questions because we're trying to get people to talk more. We're trying to not talk a lot. We're trying to use lots of so we're trying to get our clients to talk. Um, and we also use affirmations. We're trying to use affirmations that are specific. Um, so we're trying to, and very behavioral. Um, and an affirmation um, is, would be something like, I'm impressed with how mature you are. Or um, uh, I'm really amazed with how well you've been doing with your treatment. Affirmations are always about being genuine. They should absolutely come from the heart. And they're very specific to something that the client is doing. These aren't things like, oh, I'm so proud of you, or you're so smart, or something like that. Um, we also use summary statements in key ways, but really the heart of MI is about using reflections and open questions. Affirmations and summary statements are a little bit more uh, advanced. Um, let's see, how much time do I have? Okay, I'm going to skip. There's a great clip from Everybody Loves Raymond uh, on active listening, but I think I'm going to skip that, because I want to talk a little bit about change talk. So what you do when you start MI is you start talking about the thing that the person is changing using lots of um, reflective listening and open questions. And eventually, um, you get a sense of uh, the reasons why they might want to change and the reasons why they don't want to change. You get a full sense of the landscape of this thing that the person is ambivalent about. And as you talk to them more and more, you start shifting the conversation uh, in, in a strategic way in MI, so that you start getting these things, you start developing a discrepancy between where the person is now and where they want to be. And by doing that, between where they are sort of, where, you know, where they are right now. So you've been talking a lot about your drinking and you're noticing, you know, you really like drinking because it's a way to connect with your friends and it really puts you at the center. You're a really social guy and it puts you at the center of the party, and you really like this sort of being a party guy, and you're also thinking, you know, you can't keep going on like this, and you're not sure that you can, you know, keep drinking, and you're worried about the blackouts, and, you you know, you had that court problem, and the court said if they catch you um, drunk in public again, you're going to go to jail for 30 days, and that really really bugs you, and you're kind of looking at some of your friends who are more motivated, and they don't drink as much, and you really kind of wish you had a career, and you're worried that you're you know, your drinking might interfere with your career goals and kind of wondering, you know, what you make of all that. Um, And it makes you think you're sort of wanting to cut back on your drinking. You know, you're emphasizing, you start what you, so what you're starting to do is just, is validating the things they like about their behavior while also strategically 
uh, emphasizing and emphasizing more and more the things that are not working about their behavior. You're developing discrepancy between where they are and where they would like their life to be. And by doing that, you start evoking things called something called change talk, which are um, things about their desire, ability, and reasons for change, reasons and need for change. Desire statements are like, I want to change. Abilities, I can change. Reasons, I should change. And need is, I need to change. And research has shown that the more people say darn statements in session, the more that they're likely to change following sessions. And after that, people start um, giving signs of commitment or activation or actually taking steps towards change. Those are sort of the latter half. So you can get, as early as in the first session, you can get people saying, oh, I, I really want to change, or I really should change, um, or I, I really could change. You know, if I wanted to, I probably could cut back on my drinking, um, or I really need to change. If I don't, if I don't change, um, if I don't start eating more healthier, my blood sugar is going to keep skyrocketing, and I'm going to have nerve damage in my, um, in my feet or in my eyes, and that really worries me. Um, we can even start fishing for some of these change talk with some specific strategies, but we have to do this at the right time. If we start early on when we have somebody come in who's really ambivalent and we start asking, well, what are some reasons why you might want to make a change? And somebody says back to you, well, why would I want to change my drinking? Or why would I, you know, why would I want to go on a diet program? We know that it's not ready. When they start yes butting or head butting us, we know that we're fishing too early. But we can do things like asking evocative questions. What might it look like if you didn't, you didn't make a change. If you, don't ch if you don't change things the way they're going, or what would happen if, if you kept going, if things actually got worse? If you escalated your drinking, or how would you know if your marijuana use uh, was getting out of control? What would be the signs for you? How would you know? Uh, you can use things like change rulers. It's a very specific uh, technique where you ask somebody something like, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, <clears throat> how if you decided to make a change, let's say you're not going to make a change right now, but if you decided you're going to make a change, how confident are you that you could make the change that you, if you decided to go through with it? And then you follow up with, okay, well, you say you're a 7. How come you're at a 7 and not a 3? And can you imagine when you say, how come you're at a 7 and not a 3? What are they going to say? How come you're here and you're not lower? What are they going to say? What kind? Yeah, right. If you say, how come you're higher and not lower, they're going to say, it's important to me. They're going to give you all the reasons. Now, what if you say, how come you're a 7 and not a 10? How come you're not higher? What are they going to say? If you say, how come you're lower and not higher, what are the things they're going to say? Yeah, if you say, how come you're lower and not higher, they're going to give you all the reasons they don't want to change. Do you follow that? So we actually, there's specific techniques in MI, and I know I'm just giving you these like really briefly, right? But there are specific techniques we use in MI where we're trying to get certain kinds of language and not others so that we get them to say, we get them to say certain things because we're trying to get them to talk themselves into changing. And now, of course, this is already after somebody has given us, we, has been perfectly well validated. They've already told us all the reasons why they like their behavior. So if you try to do this really early, and you, you know, it's sort of like being at the gym membership, going to like a, getting a free gym membership or getting a free session at the gym. And then at the end, like, so you said that I actually had this in high school once where they were like, you said that being healthy was really important to you and you really wanted to keep working out. So why aren't you wanting to sign up for the gym? And I was like, dude, I just wanted to play racquetball with my buddy. You know, if you, that's what it'll be like if you go really early on. But if they feel really well validated and really heard and their ambivalence about changing is resolving, you can start using some of these techniques. Another great technique that you can use um, is to query extremes. You say, well, what happens um, if it gets really bad? Or, or what happens if it, um, uh, uh, if you, you can, yeah, so you, I, I'm forgetting a good example of querying extremes. Um, you can do things like looking back. So if so, a lot of times people have made multiple change attempts in the past. So you say, okay, looking back, um, what worked for you in the past, the last time you tried to make this change? What was effective for you before? Or you can say, you know, before things were like this, what did you like about your life? What used to be, what used to make you happy? How did things used to be different before all of this stuff started happening? Well, you know, I used to be, I used to be really happy. I used to be involved in a lot more things. And okay, so what, how are things different now? What sort of, and what sort of role has your drinking played in that? And they'll say, well, you know, gosh, I really, come to think of it, my drinking is really, 
I feel like it's really impacting you. So you say, okay, well, you know, so on the one hand, you have all these friends that you've made from your drinking, and you love going down to the bar, and you love karaoke. It's really become an important part of your life. And you're also seeing that it seems to be impacting your sleep, and it seems to be you're kind of gaining weight, you know, like what the heck's happening to you. And you're also kind of wondering, like, are these your friends really your friends? Because the only time you see them are, is at the bar, and you're not even sure, like, it kind of feels really shallow to you. So you're kind of, it's kind of making you wonder, like, is this social group really, you know, is this really true friendships? You can do the same kind of thing looking forward. Um, exploring goals and values. A lot of MI is about querying what's important to the person in terms of goals and values. When you get change talk, we're trying to get more. So we're trying to uh, open up our ears and we're trying to get people to elaborate. Why would that be important to you? We're trying to affirm, we're trying to reflect, and we're trying to summarize. We're trying to listen for change talk and we're trying to get more, draw for more, and always pull for more. But of course, we're always trying to be sensitive um, to the fact that if we, when we all, we're going for this, because of course, this is what we want in session. We want to hear people talking about change. We always have to be sensitive to the fact that motivation is very fluid, right? So when you like, you know, if I, w I will draw on Petraski and DeClemente a little bit, when you're taught initially the stages of change, you, you know, you think it's, you know, people walk through it and they just go from one stage to another. But the reality is people are like, okay, I'm going to change. All right, fucking, I'm not going to change. All right, I'm going to change. All right, no, I'm not going to change. All right, I'm going to sign up for that gym membership. I'm never going back to that stupid gym. You know, people's motivation is incredibly fluid, and it changes moment to moment. So you have to be constantly willing to go back and forward and back and forth and affirm and validate people's unwillingness to change and willingness to change and not take it for granted that somebody is on board with where you want them to be. Um, at the same time, we want to be elaborating, ask people to elaborate, ask open and evocative questions about the reasons why they want to change, um, affirm the desire to change, reflect their changes, and summarize all the reasons why they change. So if we want to learn MI, how do we do it? You're not going to have learned MI here, but hopefully I've given you some good ideas and some good sense of what it's like. Um, these are the stages that uh, Bill and Terry thought about about how we start learning MI. The first place is just getting the spirit of MI. The second one, and I think this is really, really important, and this is fundamental, I think, to just simply good counseling, is just using client-centered listening skills. Um, it's amazing how hard it is to use these effectively and consistently just using client-centered listening skills. And it's really funny when I um, do this, I hang out with my friends sometimes, and they say, "You're stop MIing me. And I'm literally just doing reflective listening because that comes second nature to me. Um, but uh, so my friends get really sensitive. I'm like, just, I'm just, I, this is how I talk sometimes. And uh, it's funny that that's not more second nature to most counselors and most clinicians. Um, and then just recognizing change talk and then actually learning how to elicit and reinforce change talk. Um, and then rolling with resistance. We actually now call this, um, what do we call this, dancing with, Oh, it's not even rolling with resistance anymore. Um, we, call, we also think about the opposite of change talk is counter change talk, people telling you reasons why they don't want to change. You'll also hear that. People will give you all the reasons why they don't want to change, their desire to not change. Then actually developing a change plan, consolidating commitment, and then integrating with other intervention methods. Um, and all of this learning MI takes time and practice and coaching and feedback. Um, but if you can do anything towards, you know, along these lines, even just getting the notion that listening to people's ideas about change, increasing your client-centered listening skills, um, and know that when, you're, when you feel the, the push to argue with a client about change, that shifting towards an open listening type of approach is going to be a much more effective way um, to interact with your clients than trying to argue, trying to convince. That alone will be effective, uh, and definitely more so um, than probably the other uh, things that you've been trying. So I know we're just about out of time, so um, I'll stop here. If you have any really brief questions, I can, I can answer them right now. But thanks for your time, and thanks for having me here today.